Welcome to part three of this series. We left part two at a point where Einstein had thrown doubt on the validity of three of the five classical theories and hypotheses we introduced earlier. These are the principle of relativity, the law of propagation of light, the classical theorem of the addition of velocities. He goes on to examine item four on our list. The time interval, or time, between two events is independent of the condition of motion of the body of reference. To do this, he again conducts a thought experiment, and once more he uses the coordinate systems of the embankment and the train. In section 8 of his book, he describes the thought experiment in a meticulous manner. Lightning has struck the rails on our railway embankment at two places, A and B, far distant from each other. He then makes the additional assertion that these two lightning flashes occurred simultaneously. By measuring along the rails, he says, the connecting line AB should be measured up and an observer placed at the midpoint M of the distance AB. This observer should be supplied with an arrangement, for example, two mirrors inclined at 90 degrees, which allows him visually to observe both places, A and B, at the same time. He concludes that if the observer perceives the two flashes of lightning at the same time, then they are simultaneous. Einstein offers this illustration, which I will adapt as we step through the thought experiment. This adapted diagram shows the scenario described by Einstein. The two lightning flashes strike simultaneously at A and B on the embankment. An observer is situated at point M on the embankment, and M is the midpoint between A and B so that distance x equals distance y. Now, according to the law of propagation of light, light travels at a constant speed. Therefore, the light from A will arrive at M at the same time as light travelling from B. And therefore, in Einstein's words, the observer perceives the two flashes of lightning at the same time. The two lightning strikes are thus simultaneous. We will now introduce a train which is not moving but is stationary relative to the embankment and an observer is sitting in the train at M1, the midpoint between A and B. Einstein describes this scenario. If an observer sitting in the position M1 in the train did not possess velocity, then he would remain permanently at M. In other words, the points M and M1 are perfectly aligned at the midpoint between A and B. Einstein continues, and the light rays emitted by the flashes of lightning A and B would reach him simultaneously, that is, they would meet just where he is situated. In other words, the situation for the observer on the train is exactly the same as that previously described for the observer situated on the embankment, and thus the two lightning strikes are simultaneous as observed from both the train coordinate system and the embankment coordinate system. So the interim conclusion is that when these two coordinate systems are not in motion relative to each other, then the observers on each coordinate system agree that the lightning strikes are simultaneous. 
Having established that, we can now move to the last stage of the thought experiment. At this stage, the train will be moving, moving along the embankment with a velocity v. We suppose a very long train travelling along the rails with the constant velocity v. In this circumstance, he now asks the crucial question. Are two events, for example the two strokes of lightning A and B, which are simultaneous with reference to the railway embankment, also simultaneous relatively to the train? So instead of this, when the train was stationary, we now have this with the train moving with the velocity v. We can see that nothing has changed from the perception of the observer on the embankment coordinate system. Distance x still equals y and the lightning strikes are still simultaneous. However, for the observer at M1 on the train, we can see that the light travelling from A to M1 now has a further distance to travel than the light travelling from B to M1. This is because the train has moved since the lightning strike took place, and so X1 is now greater than Y1. And because light travels at a constant speed, the light from A will reach M1 later than the light from B. Therefore, the observer at M1 will perceive that the two lightning strikes are not simultaneous. Or, as Einstein puts it, observers who take the railway train as their reference body must, therefore, come to the conclusion that the lightning flash B took place earlier than the lightning flash A. So what conclusions can be drawn from this result, which Richard Feynman named the failure of simultaneity at a distance? It could be said that this result shows that the principle of relativity does not in fact hold under this circumstance. For if we compare this result to Richard Feynman's simple description of the principle of relativity, then we see that the laws of physics do not appear the same for a moving system, the train, as they do for a system standing still, the embankment. But Einstein does not accept this conclusion with regard to the principle of relativity. He tells us that, in fact, we should not expect him to, because those of you who have carefully followed the preceding discussion are almost sure to expect that we should retain the principle of relativity, which appeals so convincingly to the intellect because it is so natural and simple. So instead of doubting the validity of the principle of relativity, he draws a different conclusion. He says that because events which are simultaneous with reference to the embankment are not simultaneous with respect to the train and vice versa. Then he concludes that every reference body coordinate system has its own particular time and furthermore unless we are told the reference body to which the statement of time refers there is no meaning in a statement of the time of an event. This is a very profound and far-reaching conclusion. Not only does it imply that item 4 on our list of theories and hypotheses is not true, it also brings Einstein into sharp disagreement with Sir Isaac Newton. In Newton's Principia, he clearly states that time is not relative, but absolute. We will leave to a later video an examination of this profound topic. But for now, following the logic of Einstein's book, we turn our attention to the last item on our list. The hypothesis that distance is absolute and does not depend on the motion of its coordinate system.
We will look at how Einstein examines this concept in the next video in this series. We will also reveal the remarkable conclusions that Einstein arrives at as a result of the thought experiments. From there, it will be a short journey to utilizing the Lorentz transformation and formulating the special theory of relativity.